I, I think I will. So uh, greetings, everyone. Good evening. And welcome to the uh, second uh, class in our Observing Basics series that's being offered by the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers. Uh, the title of this class is Choosing the Right Telescope or Binoculars to Suit Your Interests, Circumstances, and Budget. If you miss the first class, Finding Your Way Around the Night Sky, it is now available on YouTube, and the link is on our website, sfaa-astronomy.org. Uh, and so it's it's available for anyone to see there as well. And this session will is also being not only live streamed, but recorded and will later be available uh, if you know of anyone that, that missed it and might have wanted to, uh, uh, to see the class. So uh, we're doing this via Zoom. Uh, I'll ask that everyone remain muted just because background noise can be fairly distracting and hard to uh, hard to track down, at least remain muted for now. And then if we, when we get to the questions, if we can take live questions, and of course you can unmute, unmute yourself then. Uh, and in the meantime, feel free to uh, type questions in, into chat. You should have an icon at the bottom of your screen for chat, click on that, opens a box at the lower right where you can type in your question hit enter and it goes into the uh, chat stream. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, I'm going to share my screen. So tonight the, the agenda, so to speak, we'll start off with some basics about uh, telescopes. Uh, some, some metrics and their significance. Cover the three main types of telescopes. I will, as I mentioned, I will also add something at some point about the EV scope. Three main types of mounts. And then I have a matrix, it's sort of a self-assessment matrix to, 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 to help you narrow down uh, the various factors. And then uh, I'll go on to, uh, uh, apply the matrix with respect to a selection of telescopes, not so much to recommend a particular scope, but to illustrate the points that, that I've been making. And then I'll go on to binoculars, which are a great choice, either to complement a telescope or in lieu of a telescope as your first telescope. Uh, I'll be spending probably more time proportionally, proportionately on the Telescopes and the binoculars. I'm not trying to prefer telescopes to binoculars. A lot of what I'm going to be discussing with regard to telescopes uh, is also applicable to uh, binoculars. Uh, three rules, and pardon, uh, pardon me if these seem somewhat corny, but they're so true. And I know that from personal experience because I got each and every one of these wrong. The best telescope for, the, for, for you is the one you'll actually use. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So there is no perfect telescope. There is no telescope that suits all needs. Uh, and many experienced astronomers will have more than one, one telescope, I do. Uh, but what's, what's perfect for you right now is the telescope that you'll use, and that is the telescope that is if not perfect, is good enough for you and your circumstances right now. If you're in too much of a hurry, you'll probably buy a telescope that is going to take way too much time to understand uh, and learn how to use and try to trying to get it to perform according to your expectations, which it probably won't do for a while, if ever. So you can spare yourself some of that grief simply by following the third rule, keep it simple, at least in the beginning. And if you're in doubt, if you have a choice between something that's simpler and something that's more complicated, choose the one that's simpler. So a little bit about telescopes. Um, 
telescope is sometimes referred to as a light bucket because it gathers light. Just as a bucket can gather water, it gathers light much more than you can gather with your eye. If the telescope's a light bucket, your eye is a light thimble. So thousands of times more light with the telescope that it then bends into a cone, either using a lens or a mirror with a large end of the cone being where the light enters and the very narrow end coming to the focal point or plane, which is where the light then goes on to the eyepiece, kind of your own microscope to magnify it. So this diagram is of a refractor telescope, the type Galileo used. Basically a tube with an eyepiece at one end and a large lens at the other end. So the large lens in this diagram is to the left, it's the objective lens. Light comes in there, there then is bent into the cone. And that cone can be longer or shallower depending on the characteristics of your telescope. Uh, the distance between the lens and the end of the cone, the focal plane, is the focal length of the telescope. And in a refractor telescope, that generally is corresponds to the length of the tube in a refractor, I mean, in a reflecting telescope, a Newtonian, same thing. In the third type of telescope, the light is folded within the tube. So the focal length is going to be quite a bit longer than the length of the tube. But otherwise, the longer the focal length, the longer the tube. And then eyepieces come in in different sizes. Your eyepiece is going to determine your magnification. So the basic metrics, there are more, but I boiled it down just to these four. Aperture, the diameter of your main lens or mirror, uh, the most important of the metrics, because this really more than any anything else determines the amount of light that you're going to gather. The larger the diameter, the more light. Uh, for amateur telescopes, because there are lots of trade-offs, including weight and portability, uh, very large telescopes aren't really practical unless you have your own personal observatory. Um, uh, and so there are, are just practical limits on, on aperture as compared to professional telescopes or more dedicated telescopes. And it's often said, well, you should buy the most, the largest aperture you can afford. Uh, everything else being equal, that's true, I think, but everything else is never equal in amateur astronomy. There are trade-offs, bigger aperture, more expense, heavier, longer tube, less portable. And so uh, the challenge here is getting enough aperture, but also satisfying your other, your other needs and circumstances. But um, while we measure the aperture in terms of the diameter, it's really the area of that circle that you're, that, that the, the light is, your primary mirror or lens describes. So you might think, for example, that, well, an eight inch aperture is going to gather twice as much light as a four inch aperture, but actually the formula for the area is area equals pi r squared. So an eight inch telescope actually will gather just a little less than four times as much light as a four inch aperture. And there's quite a jump from say a four inch to a six inch, not quite uh, doubling the light gathering power. And then from six inches to eight inches, same thing. Uh, so uh, something to keep in mind uh, uh, as along with the second metric focal length, we've touched on that in two types of telescopes. That's basically the length of your, of your tube. Longer focal length, better for magnification, better resolution, shorter focal length, though, may be better for something like astrophotography, gives you a wider field of view and has some other advantages. 
focal ratio, the next metric is simply the ratio of the aperture to the focal length. And the range for amateur scopes, most of them on the low end, about f4. And that would that that would be definitely if you were into astrophotography, you would want something in that range f4. If you're interested in planetary, though, probably higher. Uh, so the range might go up to say F10. You want to go beyond F10, you're looking at a specialty telescope. They're certainly available, uh, but it would be a special application. So most telescopes, the focal length would actually be more in the range of say five to eight or nine. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, entry level telescopes, manufacturers made these choices for you. Your main choice is the aperture size, but these are good to know. Magnification, divide the focal length of your eyepiece into the focal length of the telescope, and that gives you your magnification. So uh, basically a shorter eyepiece is going to give you more magnification, longer eyepiece, uh, less magnification, but wider field of view. So now let's take a look at the types of telescopes. Actually, there's one more metric I, I have on a separate slide. Let's go on to that. This is important, field of view. So this is, a, is a, the image is of the uh, Andromeda galaxy, M31. And that red circle is uh, what happens when you have a narrower field of view. You can't see the entire galaxy. If you want to see the entire galaxy, you need a wider field of view, which generally means a lower, a lower focal ratio. I, I don't have a prayer of seeing it in my F10 telescope, even with a focal reducer. So it's, it, it depends on what you want to use the, the telescope for. but um, the other thing, the other uh, area where field of view becomes important is if you're using a telescope like a Dobsonian mount, which we'll get to fairly soon, um, having a wider field of view just makes it easier to find objects because Dobsonians generally don't have any computerized go-to ability. Uh, uh, they're available, but I, I, I've never actually seen one. Uh, most of the Dobsonians are moved by hand. So a wider field of view gives you a chance to find these objects. Then you can switch to a higher magnification. All right, so on to the types of telescopes. So here's Galileo on the left uh, with his original telescope uh, all those years ago, 500 years ago. And then a more modern iteration, a fairly basic Celestron refractor on the right. Pros and cons. The pros, sharper images, better contrast. Optically, the refractor is a superior instrument. Uh, and low maintenance. It's a sealed tube. It seldom needs anything, unlike other telescopes that do need maintenance. The cons, expensive, a good one, very expensive compared to the other types of telescopes. And there's a practical limit on the aperture and the focal length or ratio, because the longer the tube, the harder it is to see through the telescope. The eyepiece is at the end, the opposite end of, of, the, of, the, of the main lens that the light enters. So if you had a really long telescope, you'd either have a very tall tripod or you'd be down on your hands and knees trying to look through the eyepiece. And for that reason, you just don't see, uh, in amateur astronomy anyway, uh, diameters of more than about six inches uh, and they're expensive. The other con is chromatic aberration when the light beams go through the main lens, the primary colors can become separated and so on the right, you see what that looks like, a sort of a halo or fringe uh, around the, the object. This can be corrected. Uh, it, uh, the, the best correction is the so-called apochromatic lens, but, but 
at, at considerably greater expense. So the very popular alternative uh, for a number of reasons is the Newtonian reflector named after Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, simple telescope. So on the left, we have a, a diagram with the light entering on the right hand side. That's the open end of the telescope down to a mirror reflected off the mirror to a secondary mirror and then shut it off to the side where the eyepiece is and then and then you observe from the side and towards the top of the tube. So the cone that is formed is formed by the mirror instead of a, a lens, but the, the mirror does the same thing as a lens. It bends the light into a cone. It continues to form the cone after being uh, reflected off uh, at a 90 degree angle towards the eyepiece. So if, if, you, if we now look at the, the, the telescope on the right side, the image, you can see the open end of the telescope towards the upper left. Inside what looks like an X is called a spider. And in the middle of that spider is the secondary mirror. And then the eyepiece above that. Pros, less expensive. Eyepiece at the top, generally an advantage, as opposed to bending over to look through a refractor. Uh, depends on the mount. Uh, at some, in some cases, the eyepiece can be in an inconvenient location and one might have to move around. Uh, some telescopes are on rollers so that this can be adjusted without taking the entire telescope off the mount. Free from chromatic aberration. Uh, there are other potential aberrations that optics can correct, but chromatic aberration, no. Cons, requires collimation. So collimation is an adjustment usually made to the, both the mirrors, the primary mirror and the secondary mirror. Uh, at first, it seems like a very involved uh, process, but uh, since these telescopes unfortunately do need Periodic collimation, it's something that one gets used to uh, over time. If you had a refractor, you would not have to collimate the telescope. But when the telescopes are moved, for example, taken, transported, or maybe even taken, say, to a star party, eventually they will get out of collimation and need to be readjusted. The mirror is exposed to the air. This is not a sealed tube. So over a long period of time, the mirror will degrade may need resilvering or replacing. And then there are practical limits on focal length and the focal ratio, just because the focal length equals the length of the tube. And so uh, you do tend to see shorter focal ratios with the larger reflectors uh, because of that tube length issue. A longer tube becomes awkward to handle. And then the third type, the catadioptric. The most difficult part of this telescope is just pronouncing the name, catadioptric. Uh, it is an interesting telescope. Unlike the other two, it's a, well, it's a hybrid. It's a combination. It actually has a lens and uh, the lens is right at the top of the telescope. Look at the diagram, the upper or the to the right where the light comes in. That there's a lens there. It's called a corrector plate. It's correcting for some aberrations. Uh, and uh, the light then comes. So this is a sealed tube. The light comes in and hits the primary mirror and then forms the V or starts to form the V, goes back towards the front of the scope, hits a secondary mirror that is curved. And so that mirror sends the light back down the tube, continuing to form that V, that cone. Then it passes through a hole in the primary mirror and to the eyepiece. Unlike the refractor and the reflector telescopes that have a focuser, a focuser uh, knob that moves the eyepiece on a catadioptric telescope focuses made by moving the primary mirror. 
The result of all this is the light is folded and you can have a much shorter tube as in the, on the right. So the upper left portion of the telescope, you could see the corrector plate and that little knob-like thing in the center is where the secondary mirror is. And then it's mounted to a, a sort of a type of fork arm where it's just one arm. The eyepiece at the other end, you can barely see it on the other side of that arm. That's the eyepiece that you would look down into. So lots of advantages. Shorter too, which makes it possible to have a longer focal length, much longer focal length, higher focal ratio, greater portability, convenient viewing angle, less expensive than a refractor with the same capabilities. Um, uh, but more expensive than the Newtonian reflector. So when I say longer focal length, my telescope is the one you just saw, the 8SE, or one of my telescopes is the 8SE. And uh, it has a focal length of 80 inches, which is, would if that were a ref reflector or refractor, it just would be a non-starter. There's no way to have an 80 inch amateur telescope unless you have a dedicated um, observatory. So uh, a lot of focal length uh, for this size telescope, which means more magnification, more resolution, better for planets, but also means a smaller field of view. Uh, making it harder to find objects in the sky and making it rel just about impossible to see some of the larger deep sky objects, the, the entire object. There are some workarounds and I'm probably going to change out some of my, for example, my star diagonal, that's the eyepiece holder at the end for a larger uh, holder so I can use a lower power lens with a wider field of view. Cons, uh, takes longer to acclimate. The telescope needs to be about the same temperature as the outside temperature. And in this type of telescope, that can take a long time. If you don't acclimate the telescope, then it has convection air currents inside. And when that's really extreme, it's it, you're trying to see a planet and you magnify it, it looks like you're looking through boiling water. You have to let the scope cool off. And that could be a problem. Say you drive to a star party and the telescope's in the back of your car, even though your air conditioning is on, it's going to be warm. Then you get to the star party and the temperature's dropping. And it may be dropping faster than your telescope is cooling off. You may never catch up. The refractor is a sealed tube, but it's much better than the catadioptric telescope. So uh, uh, definitely a con in my opinion. Uh, not as sharp as the refractor because of the central obstruction, the, the, the secondary mirror, uh, and more expensive than the Newtonian. So I what about mounts? Let's talk about some mounts now. Simplest mount, the altitude azimuth mount. This is manual. Uh, altitude, up, down, azimuth, sideways. And it'll eventually move around in a circle, but horizontal. And that's it. Uh, the stars don't move up and down or right and left, they move in a circle. So tracking the stars, you will be making some fine adjustments in both dimensions. And you must have slow motion controls for this type of mount to work uh, properly. So the slow motion controls are those cables you see coming out with a knob at the end. Uh, so some advantages, uh, it's a light, it's lighter, it's an easy setup, uh, but the cons are, as I said, the tracking those stars that you have to make two adjustments or uh, the object will eventually move out of your field of view. You're trying to keep up with the object. Not as sturdy as an equatorial mount 
or the other type of mouth, the Dobsonian, subject to vibration, more subject to vibration. And uh, for the larger uh, telescopes may not, may not be practical because of restrictions on your range of movement. So the next type, the equatorial, this does track the stars. So here is a manual equatorial mount. So equatorial meaning it will move in the direction that the sky seems to move. As we know, it's the earth that's moving, but it appears that the sky is moving. And so this makes it easier to track the stars as they move. It's a, it's a more solid mount, but it's a heavier mount and it has a counterweight to balance the telescope. The counterweight weighing roughly what the telescope weighs. So you're adding weight, to, and, but uh, of course on the plus side, you have a sturdier mount, but it's, it's more to carry. It's, long, it's a longer setup time because it must be aligned. That's the green arrow. It must be aligned to the uh, celestial North Pole in order to track the stars properly. And you don't need to do any of that with the uh, alt azimuth mount. Next type of, well, I guess I've already gone over the pros and cons. Um, yeah, more complicated, longer setup time, heavier on the con side. So now the Dobsonian mount, the invention of John Dobson and a very popular mount, very simple. So three, three different iterations of the Dobsonian mount here. On the left is one that uh, was made by one of our members uh, from plywood, uh, not manufactured. And uh, uh, it basically is an alt azimuth mount in that it spins around on its base. So that movement, and then the up-down movement on the axis. And it's moved by hand. There, you can buy Dobsonians with motorized controls, but they're uh, more expensive, and uh, I have yet to see one. Now, in the middle is uh, a manufactured. This is a, a, a system from a manufacturer. I think it's a Celestron. Uh, but same same principle. The base rotates, so that's your azimuth direction. And then uh, you can see the axis protruding from the side of this uh, for the up-down movement, the altitude movement. And you simply move the scope by hand. Uh, here is where a bigger field of view really comes in handy to find what you're looking for as you look through the eyepiece. And to the right, uh, one of the advantages of the Dobsonian is it will take a bigger telescope. At some point, it's too big. You're standing on a stepladder to look through the, uh, the, the eyepiece. But this is uh, a 12-inch. And I think the tube is still only about 50-something inches long, may maybe 60, so that would be five feet. Um, the Dobsonian will handle this heavier telescope. It does need to be balanced, but it will handle this. And it's a relatively sturdy mount. It does not suffer from vibration uh, the way, say, an alt azimuth mount um, uh, on a tripod would, uh, would vibrate. And vibration is a problem for telescopes. You might not notice it, but your telescope does. And everything it notices gets magnified by maybe a hundred times. So you do not want excess vibration. Now we get into the uh, computerized mounts. So here would be, um, oh yeah, I haven't gone over uh, all the pros and cons. Uh, maybe, let's see, fast setup. All right, very fast. You basically just set the telescope into the mount. Uh, simple to use, sturdy, accommodates larger scopes. Cons has to be moved by hand. No slow motion, slow motion adjustment. The slow motion adjustment is you moving your hands more gently. Used only for Newtonian reflectors. A uh, refractor wouldn't work. Uh, catadoptric wouldn't work. 
and not usable for deep sky astrophotography, which requires an equatorial mount if you're taking time exposures, timed exposures. Okay, so now we're on to the motorized mount. This is uh, for an equatorial telescope. You see the counterweights on the scope. Um, and this is uh, both uh, tracking and go-to. So you enter information and uh, align the telescope and it will find objects per your instructions and it will, will track those objects so that if you want to take a timed exposure and you've set this up right, then you should see a clear image. You, if not, then you'll have some blurring, you'll have some star trails. Uh, I don't own one of these, but from what I hear, really, it's a nice, it's a nice idea. But unless you have uh, something called a guide scope, it's probably going to disappoint. So a guide scope would be something else you put on your telescope that has its own camera and will communicate with the mount and make very fine corrections so that you do track um, the objects you're, you're imaging. Uh, longer setup, you need to align it very closely with the celestial north pole. Uh, substantial learning curve to figure all this out. And uh, I mentioned it, it may require, probably will require if you're doing astro imaging, uh, a guide scope. So on the alt azimuth mount, this is also a go-to telescope, but alt azimuth, not usable for long, for astro imaging where you're taking a longer exposure because alt azimuth telescopes to follow the stars have to make small movements on two planes, up, down, right, left, little pulses. In fact, the drive on this has two motors and two sets of gears, one for each direction, as opposed to um, uh, the uh, equatorial mount, which when it's tracking just, just uses one motor. It's still, although it's simpler and an easier setup than an equatorial by a substantial amount, it is still somewhat complicated. Uh, and there is a learning curve. The system is, is, is very interesting. It's primitive, frankly, as far as computers go. Reminds me of my old DOS computer when I was starting out. You had to enter precise commands in just the right order or it wouldn't work. And if it didn't work, it wouldn't tell you why. And that, that, that pretty much describes my Celestron. Um, if it doesn't work, you have to go back and start over and try to think, what did you do wrong? What did you enter wrong? What sequence might you have done in, in the wrong way? I mean, after a while, you finally get used to it and you don't have to keep starting over. But I would not underestimate the amount of time that it takes to figure this out and get used to things like backlash and uh, the, the way you have to end each... Uh, each uh, go to, uh, there's a certain sequence you have to go to or go through, excuse me, uh, or you'll have too much slack in the gears. I'm not going to go into any more detail, but you get the idea. There's a lot to learn. I finally broke down and bought a separate book just on this telescope. The, uh, the manual I found only got me so far. So uh, be warned. All right. Here's the matrix that I mentioned. And this is, this is not you know, a rating. Uh, you're not, it's not gonna tell you're a good astronomer, a bad astronomer. It's going to help you understand what your needs are. And, and uh, it uh, uh, is set up to be sort of self-rating on a scale of one to 10. So the budget category, the lower end, you're probably not going to find an adequate telescope that is new for much less than $200. You can find a telescope for less than $200, but it won't be, it won't be adequate. It'll, it'll have a, one or more major flaws probably. On the higher end, 
$4,000 gets you a nice telescope, but you could spend much more if, if you want. I mean, literally, not, I mean, figuratively, the sky is the limit, no pun intended. Um, but $4,000 will get you a very nice six inch refractor, a nice mount, lenses and all those other extras you want are on top of that. Um, so if, you, if, you re, if, the, if, if expense is a concern, then you want to be more towards the one side. If it's not a concern, and all your other numbers are ones, and this one is a 10, don't spend more money. I'm not trying to save you money, I'm trying to save you trouble. Money buys complexity, and if you're just starting out, that's the last thing you need right now. You'll spend all your time trying to get your telescope to work the way it's supposed to work, the way you expected it to work, and trying to figure out why that's not happening. Need for portability. Cindy Hill mentioned this. I am a poster child for a need for portability. I have no clear views of the sky from my home. I live on a steep hillside. Anything I do at home, I have to lug something up and down stairs, up and down a steep street, the kind you can get about out of breath just walking up and down at a fast pace. So I need, I need uh, something portable because usually to observe with my telescope, I'll be traveling and I'll be carrying that telescope up and down stairs. Uh, on the other end, if you happen to have a, a nice level yard uh, and uh, maybe a three car garage and a split place to put your larger telescope in the garage without taking it apart every time, maybe put the lens caps on and then cover it with the tarp. Uh, then, then perhaps you don't have that kind of need unless you intend to travel with the telescope. Uh, tech, tech and mechanical aptitude and interest, I should add. Some people have the aptitude, but they just don't want to bother with this. Um, other people do have the aptitude and they love to tinker and they're very good at this. And actually the, the technical challenge is probably very appealing just a matter of individual choice. The problem areas where you either don't have the aptitude or you don't have the interest and you're stuck with all this tech and you're not observing the sky, which is, which is really after all the goal. Available space in your car and home, smaller car, maybe you're going to Uber, um, or on the other hand, maybe you have a Suburban uh, or a truck. Everybody's different, but if your space is limited, watch out for tube length. Telescopes are not like skis. They need to be treated very gently. Make sure your car seat is wide enough if you're gonna strap it across the car seat. And your home, where are you going to put this? If you have plenty of room, not an issue. If you don't, or you live in an apartment, it is an issue or it will be. Time, are you time crunched? Kids, soccer practice? a lot of work, travel, or are you retired, bored, plenty of time, can't wait to get going on this. Makes a big difference. Experience, are you a beginner? Or maybe not a beginner, you had a telescope but you haven't used it for a while, you're thinking of getting something better or updating it, more, more on one side. More experience and really looking to specialize will you be closer to um, the 10 side. And then your goals. Maybe you're open. Try everything. Try some planets. Try some deep sky. On the other end, maybe you have a specific goal or need, such as, uh, so let's say astrophotography. If you're interested in astrophotography, my next question would be, what type of astrophotography? If you tell me deep sky, okay, we're, we're now we know what type of telescope you need. I mean, there's still quite a range of options, but um, uh, so people are different and needs are different. I'd say if you're more on the one side as to most of these, then, then the message is keep it simple. Uh, uh, but it really, it really depends on, on, on how you wind up. So let's talk about, let's try applying this now. 
uh, into some different scopes. I'm not recommending these scopes necessarily, uh, unless I do, but um, I've tried not to recommend them because some of them I've never tried. I've heard about them or maybe friends like them, but uh, do check before you buy anything, of course, check it out, check the reviews, ask around. All right, so here, we start on the left, the Star Blast. A member did recommend this. I haven't used it. This is the $200 option. You could find others for a bit less, but make sure you, you do hit the minimums. I have a chart with minimums. Four and a half inch, relatively fast. In other words, low focal ratio F4, lightweight. Short tube sits on a table. So you could literally take it out in your backyard and set it on a table and start observing. You're already, you're ready to go. Uh, if you're traveling, well, you'll need a table. Either bring a table or go to a place where there's a table. There are no tables at the star party, so it's BYOT, bring your own table and maybe a chair. This comes in at six inch as well. Um, that is the same principle. It is a, a Dobsonian mount and it sits on a table. Six inch would give you quite a bit more, but it's also more expensive. On the right, for $450, an eight inch Dobsonian Skywatcher, which is a good brand. Uh, uh, quite, a, quite a capable telescope, total weight 49 pounds, split, I think about evenly between the base and the tube. It comes in a six inch as well, if that's too much. It also comes in something that's collapsible with poles on each side and it's open. And so it'll collapse and then extend again. Both, both that option will cost more, but that's a possibility. Comes in a longer focal length, a little longer tube, more expensive, but you can see you have quite a few options here and still in a very moderate price range. Okay, here is the catadioptric that I have. Uh, $1,200 for what you get, that's not a bad price. Um, go to telescope, uh, quite capable, but at eight inches on that mount, it's pushing it. And I've had some complaints about vibration and how much weight that tube can carry and so forth. Um, so, uh, but it's a short tube. This says 16 inches. It's really, I think, more like 17 inches, but as you, you can see, very short and only 35 pounds for the whole thing. So I can literally pick it up and move it with the tripod attached if I want to just move it a few feet. Otherwise, I take it apart and none of the components weighs all that much. It goes into, th I, I use three separate cases uh, so that when I'm going up and down stairs, it's, it's, I don't have to lug something up a large case over steps and so forth. Uh, so I said I wasn't going to recommend anything, but I will not recommend this telescope it's complicated. If you're really willing, you really want this kind of telescope and you're willing to spend this kind of money, I'd spend a bit more and get the next model up, the evolution in the eight inch size. Better gearing, better mount, um, and some other features. And the refractor, just to give you an idea, I am not recommending this telescope. I'm just telling you that if you wanted a six inch refractor, which is about the equivalent of an F8, I mean, a uh, eight inch reflector or catadioptric, uh, $1,500, it's achromatic, not apochromatic. It's got a go-to mount, but there, this is, this is where you could easily go from 1,500 to $4,000, getting a better scope. Um, but it gives you an idea of what, what what, what might be available. If you're more towards the one side of this, I would seriously consider the Dobsonian mount. It's simple. Um, you find the objects yourself by pushing the telescope around. You learn the night sky. One thing about GoTo is it not only takes a while to learn and use, you're not necessarily learning how to find anything except the buttons on your telescope. And some minimums before I move on to uh, binoculars. Um, some minimum sizes, minimum features. Uh, 
you do on a refractor want to make sure you have some kind of chromatic correction. I wouldn't go lower than about 70 millimeters. That's about a little less than three inches. The Newtonian, uh, make sure it's a parabolic mirror, at least four inches of aperture. Manual mounts, just make sure it's sturdy and you have some slow motion controls unless it's a Dob, Dobsonian. Eyepieces, most of them will come, the better ones with fossils at least. Kellner is okay, but some of these other lenses I wouldn't, that are cheaper wouldn't do it. Eyepiece holder, minimum 1.25 inches, that's standard. Two inches better for your Dobsonian. Go-to mounts, go for it if you want to, if you're tech oriented, otherwise you might wanna pass it up. Uh, don't go to general purpose stores, use, well, there aren't any astronomy stores, so that's easy in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. If, you, if you're somewhere else, you have an astronomical store, fine, don't, don't buy a telescope at a general purpose store and $200. Okay, on to binoculars. This is a great alternative. Uh, think of binoculars as small, uh, smaller refractors. Actually, some of them are not that much smaller than refractors. They're shorter, shorter focal length. Uh, it's a great way to learn the night sky. And frankly, it's just fun. It really is. With the telescope, you're looking at a small slice of the sky. And with binoculars, you, you feel like you're really out there. You're really looking at the sky. And if you live in a light polluted area, as we do in the Bay Area, suddenly, like a miracle, you can see the sky that you always knew was there, but can't see. But you can through binoculars. Wide field of view, so you can scan. Scanning in a telescope is useless, but you can scan with binoculars. Um, and uh, you can see the larger structures, like the Andromeda galaxy, the star clusters. Two eyes are better than one. Uh, uh, so say a 70 millimeter, uh, uh, a 70 millimeter uh, um, refractor as compared to a 70 millimeter uh, set of binoculars, you're going to see more, you're going to see better contrast, you're going to see more colors. But the main advantage is it's just grab and go. I mean, really, it's so simple. There's no setup. You don't have to worry about which eyepiece. You, you don't have a choice. It comes with the eyepieces it comes with. Some, these, we've already dealt with a lot of these things. I'll just go over this quickly. Objective size, that is the aperture. Magnification, it's what the scope, it's what your binoculars come with. And every pair of binoculars will have this stamped on it. Say you have your stamp says seven times 50. Seven is the magnification, 50 is the aperture size, 50 millimeters. Weight, something to think about for heavier ones because you'll be holding them. Uh, below about two pounds, not a big deal. Above that, you need some kind of a plan, either a mount or something, some other way to take some of the weight off your hands and hold them steady. Field of view, well, the more magnification you have here too, the narrower the field of view, but it will still be a lot more than a telescope. But I would pay some attention to that particularly. Exit pupil is the size of the little circle that comes out of the binoculars and comes out of the eyepiece of a telescope. Why is that important? Well, some people say it's not that important but other people think it is, so I'll mention it. You're, you see through the pupil of your eye, the pupil gets bigger or smaller depending on the light. In the dark, it expands. The younger you are, the more it expands, maybe seven millimeters. The older you are, you might not get past five millimeters. So the exit pupil of the eyepiece or the binoculars is the size of the image as it comes out of the eyepiece of the telescope or the binoculars. And uh, at, at least uh, some would maintain that you don't want that exit pupil from the telescope to be bigger than your pupil, or you will be wasting some of that light. 
In other words, that the exit pupil of your binoculars is five millimeters and your eye expands to five millimeters in the dark, well, then it's a match. But if it's a seven millimeter exit pupil and your eye only expands, expands to five, then, then you've got more light coming out than you can use. Eye relief. If you wear glasses and you know you need glasses to look through a telescope eyepiece or through binoculars, you should be concerned with this because you need enough distance so that you can keep your glasses on and still see. Uh, uh, most people who need glasses don't have eye relief problems. Uh, it can be a comfort issue, but it's, it's just another thing to consider along with other uh, metrics here. And then finally, coatings. The more expensive binoculars are going to have better optics and more coatings. There are a lot of lenses inside binoculars and the coatings keep down internal reflections and diffraction. Uh, but uh, at some point you, you probably have enough. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you go out and buy high-end binoculars. I think it's not that hard to find binoculars that are good enough. So where, where are we? Four options. Number one, use the binoculars you already have. If you have them in your closet, or maybe you know somebody who has them and will lend them to you, just start out with those. Option two, if you're going to buy binoculars in a medium size, here are three sizes that one of our members recommends uh, as, as his favorites. Um, they all are going to produce an exit pupil of five or less. That may be why he was recommending them. And they'll all have a relatively wide field of view, seven or eight millimeters. And they're light enough to be handheld. And uh, you can spend as little as, say, around $80 for a decent pair of binoculars. Of course, you could go spend $350 as well. Uh, but you have a choice. Um, whatever, if you decide to buy them, try to find a store that sells them. The astronomy stores are gone, but there are stores that sell binoculars, including, uh, I went to a place that sells binoculars for birding, for, for observing birds. They had quite a selection, all reasonably priced. Option three, larger binoculars. I've listed one 15 by 70. Another option would be to go larger on the magnification 20, say times 70 or 20 times 80. But bear in mind, as you do that, your field of view shrinks. 15 times 70 would give you a field of view of 4.4. And they're heavier, um, between three and four pounds or more. So holding them gets to be an issue. Uh, it, uh, you may need you may need, need a mount or some kind of system to 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 handle that extra weight. Uh, fairly high quality uh, set of astronomical binoculars, fifteen times seventy, about one hundred eighty-five to two hundred dollars, about the cost of an entry-level telescope. Although the entry-level I showed you had a had a mount, this would not have a mount. You need any mount would be of course on top of this. And then, just for the heck of it image stabilized binoculars, the gold standard, because you don't have to worry about a mount, they're lightweight, and you don't have to worry about, about holding them steady because they steady themselves, but they're expensive. This would be the Canon 40, 10 times 42L, a cool $1,600, uh, but, but very nice. So here's what I just happen to have around the house. Uh, at the top, a set of REI binoculars that I used for hiking. They just put it in a backpack. Down below, a set of binoculars I use for boating, seven times 50 for boating. On the right, a camera tripod or a tripod for birding binoculars. Very compact, changes into a monopod if you want. In other words, just a single pole. On the left, an adapter that screws onto the front of either one of these binoculars so they can go on the top of the tripod or the monopod. 
Second option, astronomical binoculars. These are 15 times 70s. To the left is a monopod that extends to seven feet with a ball grip, pistol grip, ball mount at the top. And uh, this has the, the mount adapter attached to the front of it. And so here's what I would do. Here I am looking, here's my monopod. I don't use a tripod because I don't have anything that's level to put a tripod on. If I'm walking up and down the street, the monopod takes the weight off and actually holds these remarkably steady. Even with a smaller pair of binoculars, since you're magnifying the image, you will have a problem with movement. You'll have to find some way to steady that, maybe lie down, maybe lean against something, use a monopod or a tripod. So uh, the monopod has been a great solution for me. So if you really want big binoculars, here you go, parallelogram mount with the counterweight. Now you, of course I couldn't use this because it needs a tripod. But the beauty of this is that uh, it gets you away from the tripod. So you could be seated, you could lie down on a chess lounge and you can look overhead. Something that even with my monopod is difficult. I have to sort of angle it if I want to look straight up. Uh, and if you let go of it, it'll just stay. It won't move. Anyway, that's a possibility. So do consider binoculars as your first observing instrument or uh, as a complement. Something that you it's easy to take with you, uh, travel friendly, airplane friendly, up to a point. And here are some other resources on binoculars. Uh, the, uh, this, this one, binocular highlights, second edition, 109 celestial sites, not available on Amazon, but you can get it from Sky and Telescope. $25, frankly, I would just get the first edition. You can get it for Kindle for $10 but you have to go through the Amazon website. And then touring the universe through binoculars that a friend recommended, uh, a longer, more complete book. They're both great. Um, and then I've added some links as well for some additional information about uh, binoculars. So whatever you choose, um, I, uh, I hope it, uh, it works well for you. Um, uh, I, uh, it's a complicated decision. There's no reason to rush it. And there's another reason not to rush it, which is everybody seems to be back ordered now on everything. Somehow astronomy became much more popular during the pandemic, even though we can't have star parties and whatnot. Uh, but it is, a, it is a great hobby. And uh, if you're not already a member of SFA, I hope you'll consider joining us and joining us when we can finally resume our uh, star parties. I should add, we do have a loaner program. We haven't been able to use it because of COVID, but we do have a selection of scopes and members can check out scopes and use them. And uh, if you need assistance, we can also arrange that. Um, and uh, with that, I will stop the share and uh, open it up for any questions you might have. Hey, Bill, great presentation. That was a lot of good information. Uh, it'll take a little while to digest it all, I think. But uh, I, I had two comments on two of your slides. You're talking about um, how the telescope itself uh, at night uh, has to acclimate and it cools down. And I remember the first time I was using a, uh, my DAB and it literally got wet. And so I learned that one of the astronomer's tools that you have to have is a towel. Um, you know, to sort of take that moisture off the outside as it's getting uh, cooled down. The other thing is you noted that the DOB scopes must be moved by hand. And boy, is that true. Um, in the time it takes to uh, get it aligned on something and then have somebody have a look at it, you know, the earth is moving, everything out there is moving, then you have to move it again. So, um, you know, the downside of things that you have to move by hand is you have to do it often uh, if, if there's something in particular that you want to keep up with. 
But um, I just thought I'd mention those because I, I thought of those as I was uh, looking at your slides. But Bill, you've got some great questions here. So if you don't mind, I'll kind of go through them for you. Uh, um, sure, just uh, Liz, one thing on the, on the uh, bringing a towel. Somebody mentioned they were over at the Presidio. Uh, it might've been Thomas who's over at the Presidio and uh, fortunately packed up just before the sprinklers came on. Oh, so when you're out observing on a lawn, beware, bring your we're going to have to we're going to have to uh, make some notes <laughs> of where those sprinklers are so that we don't yeah. have star parties near those. Right. Hey, Bill, I wanted to come back to Bud's question. He had asked if you're going to be talking about the EV scope as an alternative. And I wanted to make sure that if um, if you didn't already answer his questions, that you could come back to that for him. Oh, thanks, Liz, for reminding me. I was going to mention it and I got carried away with my PowerPoint. So the EV scope is a, it's a hybrid. It's, it's partly a telescope and partly a digital camera. Instead of looking through an eyepiece, you are actually looking, the eyepiece, you're looking at a display that is similar to what you would see on the back of your digital camera with live view, uh, except it, it's circular. So it looks like you're looking through an eyepiece, but there's no direct observation. What the, what the EV scope does though, is it, it, it simplifies setup and uh, it is uh, the best go-to system I've ever seen. It is pretty close to fully automated, unlike say my 8SE. And so you set it up, you level it, you do need to level it and you tilt it a bit. Normally it's straight up and down, you tilt it and then you Using your cell phone, you set up a little private network with your cell phone or a tablet. You ask it to go ahead and, and, and start the process. So it will figure out where it is using its own camera and something called plate solving. And then it basically says, okay. And then you tell it where you wanna go and it makes some suggestions and then it goes there. And it's fascinating to watch it, which you can do on your tablet or cell phone, find the object. And it may take it a couple of tries, it moves around a bit, and then you can see it's found the object, it centers it. And then the next choice is, do you wanna take a picture of it? And if you do, then it will take a series of very short exposures and then stack them in real time. This is something in astro imaging you generally have to do separately on a laptop, but it does it for you. And you can see this image becoming clearer and clearer and clearer. It, it's really amazing and pretty good quality considering what it's doing. You see the image on your cell phone or tablet. You can snap a photo that will go into your photos library, or you can see the whole thing through the eyepiece or both. Very convenient. F4, 4.5 inches, not good for planetary. Save your time. I rushed out to see Jupiter and Saturn, you know, when they were so close. <laughs> Oh man, oh, what a disappointment. Better than Galileo had, but uh, not a lot. So it's deep sky. It is a deep sky instrument. I got mine because I have to travel. I, you know, have telescope while travel. And uh, so it, the setup thing really is inconvenient. To, to take it all the way somewhere just to maybe spend a half an hour I just wouldn't do it with my 8SE, but the EV scope, piece of cake. It's already in a backpack. You charge it up, it stays charged for a month. I just get the backpack. Literally, I have the tripod clipped to the backpack and I take it out. I've set it up in five minutes. It takes another five minutes for it to find, a, find something you could photograph. So I could do a half hour session, no problem. So I, I really like it for that. And for a place like San Francisco, it's, it, it, it works well. And there's a network of people. I mean, you can, if you're into this, you can go watch people in France and what they're looking at tonight. Remember the time difference though. And they have events every week or so where everybody gets together and they look at the same thing. Uh, so it's, it's also a sort of a group thing, like some of these bicycle programs you can use where you're riding your own bike in your garage, but you're also competing against people who are all tuned into the same network. Uh, it's fun, it's a fun scope. And I think it will be the future really of go-to on telescopes that are going to probably take 10 years to catch up. 
and it's not cheap. It's about $3,200 and you have to wait and you consider yourself very lucky when the scope finally gets here. It took me, I think, five months to get it. But I, I do recommend it, uh, but not for planetary. And, and everything I said about learning the night sky and all that, of course, you're, you're, you're sort of learning, but um, I still recommend starting doing something that's going to help you learn the night sky. It's always valuable to know that. All right, so I hope I answered. Maybe, maybe that's more detail than you were looking for, but that's my experience so far. Great. Hey, uh, Bill, we had two questions from Curtita. First was, um, are AZ mounts not good for astrophotography? They are not good for deep sky imaging uh, because of the fact that they just can't track a, a star smoothly. Given, given that they can't move with the stars. And for a longer exposure, and some of these do take long exposures to, even if you stack them, there's something called field rotation that the equatorial can handle, but the alt azimuth mount cannot. However, if you want to do planetary astroimaging, that's a different deal. There you're paid, taking a picture with a webcam. You're just taking a lot of images and processing the heck out of them using software. Uh, and so it's it's a whole different animal than than uh, deep sky astroimaging where you have faint objects. If your the planets are bright, and it doesn't take too long to expose that with your with your uh, imaging device, your camera. But you take a lot of it's like taking a short movie. Then you take all those frames. Your software gets rid of the bad frames, keeps the better ones, and then keeps processing them until you get a nice clear image. So. If you had an alt as mount, and particularly an alt as tracking mount like my 8SE, that would be fine uh, for, for, for that type of planetary, but it's just planetary. By that, I mean bright planets, uh, not Neptune. <laughs> I mean, Mars, uh, uh, Jupiter, Saturn at opposition. Opposition meaning they're on the opposite side as the sun is, meaning they're on our side. They're, they're the closest to Earth, um, everything else being equal. And then Bill, how is the AZ mount different from a Dobsonian mount, just for clarification? They're, they are both, they are both, uh, both alt azimuth mounts. Um, they both move in the same two planes, up, down, and then sideways. But the uh, alt azimuth mount, the classic mount would be typically on a tripod. Uh, and something that you could control with your fine motion controls. Uh, whereas the Dobsonian is always sitting on a base uh, in, that is either on a table or on the ground. You know, Bill, you started off by saying the best telescope is the one you'll actually use. And here's a great tip from Philip. He says, if you have a large Dob, and I guess it could actually uh, apply to just about any scope if they're big, get a gorilla cart from Home Depot. Uh, you'll use your telescope a lot more. So I guess just, just helps with the portability. Yes, yes, I, I, I completely uh, agree with that comment. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it sort of depends on your, your situation. If you're going to haul it up to a star party, the gorilla cart can get you to your car, but at some point you're, you're going to have to lift it and transport it. But if you're fortunate enough to be in a place where you have a relatively level viewing area at home, sure, pull it out on the cart, put it in the garage, cover it, saves a lot of time. Great, um, here's a couple more questions. Peter asks, are there particular brands that you would recommend for the binoculars that you discussed? Um, well, if it's the image stabilized, yes, the Canon, <laughs> but that's, those are the ones that are $1,600. Um, so, uh, I, my larger binoculars are, uh, Celestron Skymaster XLT binoculars, and they seem fine. Um, and you could certainly spend more money than I did and get better ones. Um, I, I mean, other manufacturers seem to have good products as well, like Orion, for example, on the binoculars. 
on the, uh, the, the, the less expensive binoculars, Bushnell's always had a good reputation, Nikon. Uh, basically the companies that make pretty decent camera equipment are probably making pretty good binoculars. But I can't say I really have wide experience. So with the binoculars, I would definitely recommend going into a store and just hanging out there and asking questions, looking at the binoculars. A couple of those uh, resources that I mentioned, I think there's one there, an article that talks about how you can just pick up a pair of binoculars and look in them. Just, just look through the, the uh, aperture in and, and see what you see inside and reflections. Are there any internal reflections? and then take them outside and look to make sure both the barrels are lined up properly, uh, those kinds of things. Here's an interesting question from Nate for you, Bill. Um, as more satellites continue to create more light pollution, would that change your pros and cons or suggestions? Well, <laughs> it's kind of distressing to see all these things. It was very interesting at first uh, to see this, whatever, whatever Musk calls his train, you know, the, the satellites all moving together. And then it wasn't, it wasn't so interesting after that because I had my EV scope and I thought, I don't want to be taking pictures of those things. Now, I think we're going to have a big problem with all these satellites. But no, it wouldn't really change my, uh, my suggestions. It's going to be the biggest, in addition to just being a distraction, uh, it's going to be the biggest challenge for people who are really patiently trying to take long exposures only to find that they have a big streak down the middle of their, their picture. But no, otherwise I don't think it would, would, would affect, uh, affect the recommendations. And supposedly some of the satellite companies are working with associations of astronomers to see what they can do to minimize this. But the plans call for so many of these satellites to have worldwide kind of Wi-Fi, not encouraging. Uh, Bill, we also have a couple of questions about uh, the EVs. Jerry would like to know, why is the EV not suitable for planetary? Um, I, I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's simply something that is optimized for deep sky and the trade-offs were such that uh, on the other end, it just is, uh, well, it's the opposite of optimized. Um, so for example, the focal ratio is F4. Well, normally for planetary, you would want the higher focal ratio of say F10, what I have in my 8SE or more. I mean, some of these specialty telescopes, you could get up into say F20. You'd have a very narrow field of view and a very specialized telescope. Uh, so F4 is on the short end and uh, for some of the bigger telescopes, particularly the Newtonians, you don't have much of a choice but to keep the focal ratio pretty low. But then you correct with the optics and you have a bigger aperture. But with this smaller aperture, four and a half, and the fast F4, I think that's the main problem. Uh, or that's my theory. I mean, I haven't really seen anything on that, but I've heard a lot of complaints uh, that it's just not suitable for planetary. Just use it for deep sky. And then another question on the EV scopes from Jim, will they work for solar astronomy? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really dangerous. Solar astronomy is just only do solar astronomy with a lot of thought, the right filters and everything else. But I'm sorry if I overreacted, but- No, you, I, I, I don't no, think you overreacted. There are no filters available for the EV scope. Just, no, I think you're definitely trying to convey yeah. caution. And there are no filters available to allow uh, safe no. viewing? There are no filters, no astrophotography uh, options at all other than what it comes with. It will transmit the image to your uh, tablet or cell phone. I hope that that's clearly marked in all of the instructions so that uh, people don't damage their eyes looking to, to try to capture good solar views then. Yeah, I mean, it would have to, uh, it would actually have to go through uh, the, the sensor. You'd probably just damage the sensor rather than your eyes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't experiment. I wouldn't try it. So Bill, those are all the questions that we have in the chat. Um, I didn't know if anybody who's still on the call had any questions that they wanted to uh, either type in or chime in and ask you directly, but please feel free if you have any questions, everybody. 
And if we want to give everybody just a second for that, Bill, I'm not sure that you mentioned um, what the next class topic will be. And I thought that while we've got some people um, on, they might like to hear what that is. And of course, then they can watch all of the different communication channels where they learned about this one to get the details for the upcoming one. But I just thought you might like to mention the next one. Sure, yeah. Well, the next one is um, going to be, we've talked about choosing a telescope. The next one will be now using the telescope. And of course, people have a lot of different types of telescopes. So I probably can't go into too much detail on each particular type of telescope, but there are some general topics about preparing for observing, popular accessories, uh, techniques that I think are more universal for locating objects. Um, so uh, as in as much detail as we can using your telescope and uh, uh, or, and or binoculars. And then by the way, the final class, Liz, is will be astroimaging. And I'll talk in more detail then about the different types of astroimaging and what's involved. And that gets to be fairly specialized, but I find that is one area where people uh, don't really have a good understanding of the different, the different types of astroimaging. And uh, well, I, I touched on that, that Planetary and deep sky are quite different. And there are other types of astroimaging, by the way, taking nightscapes and whatnot. So that would be the last class. Sounds good. Bill, thanks for that. Um, and thank you so much for putting together this class and the whole series. It's just a wealth of knowledge that, that you have and that you're sharing and it's, it's incredibly valuable. And I, I'm sure that from the comments we've seen, people have been engaged here that everyone really appreciates it. So thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Liz. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And hope we'll see you uh, at the next class. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you, Bill. It was a great class. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jessica.